was drunk. I mean, no doubt about it. But they <laughs> invited me back to give talks. And they said, you know, and the people who were sober said, yeah, your talk was really good. So <laughs> I'm <of> here right now. <laughs> Right. Okay. We've got a live stream. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. So okay. we're going to start. We're going to start in, a, in about a minute. Okay. I'm just going to start the recording as well. Okay. Uh, record to the cloud. Okay, everybody. So we're recording and we're live streaming on YouTube. Good. I will now mute myself and it's over to you. Thank you. One thing I just want to mention, I'm not seeing anything on the, my screen that allows me to share my screen. I think when I stop sharing my screen, you, okay. you should be able to, to, to share it. But okay. if, it's a, if it's a problem, I'll have to make you a co-host at that point in time. Yeah, okay. I've just given you the, uh, the setting so that you, you can share it once Steve's is off. Oh, okay, good. Thanks, Mark. There we go. Okay, uh, we shall start then in that case. So meeting started. Hello everybody, good evening. Welcome Hello. to- Good evening. Welcome, welcome from the uh, spare bedroom of my house. Um, <laughs> it's not the Quaker meeting house, but uh, that is, hopefully that will come back one day. So welcome to everybody. Uh, welcome to the online monthly meeting of the Liverpool Astronomical Society. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Steve Southern, the president of the Liverpool Astronomical Society. Uh, life continues to be somewhat different to the norm at the moment, but uh, let's all fingers crossed that um, these new vaccines will be quickly rolled out and at some point next year, we can get back to some sort of normality. Now, this is our fourth uh, online monthly meeting and we will be continuing to hold our monthly meetings online using Zoom. Now, I've, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Is anybody else getting that? No. It, it, no. Could, it could Patricia mute her mic. So could, could everybody uh, mute, please, and uh, take off your video, please? And hopefully that should make the um, make it make it a bit easier. Okay, thank you. Okay, and we're going to carry on using Zoom for the for the foreseeable future. Um, I'd like to welcome. Again, our new pending members to this evening meeting, if this is your first one. Uh, I understand we've got something in the region of 25 members waiting to join the society, uh, but our constitution uh, rules say that we uh, have to vote you in at a monthly meeting at the Quaker Meeting House. So uh, we look forward to seeing you there next time. We can all gather, gather um, for a, a real meeting once again. Um, I'd like to welcome any visitors that um, have joined in today. I know there's been a few people invited in as guests, so welcome to those. And also welcome to anybody that's joined via our YouTube channel. Now, can I ask you all to mute your microphone, stop your video, join the meeting, please. And when we, uh, when we finish the meeting, there'll be a, a virtual pub afterwards uh, where we can all go back to... Um, turning all our microphones and videos back on and have a good chat afterwards. And a beer, of course, but uh, you have to drink that on your own by yourself and you have to go and get it yourself as well. Now, you may also wish to minimise the view of all the attendees so you haven't got uh, windows all down the side of your screen. And that way you'll see the, the full screen of our guest speaker when he's sharing his screen. And then you can go back to gallery mode uh, at the end of uh, Bob's meeting. And just once again, this meeting is being recorded. OK, so moving on. Um, this is the point where we normally read out the minutes of the last meeting. But uh, under these conditions, we, we uh, won't be doing that. However, the council, the council members have approved the minutes. And so uh, I'll ratify them now. So uh, they will be signed by me later. And if any member wants a copy of the minutes of the last monthly meeting, please ask and we will uh, forward one on to you. So I'll move on to announcements. Uh, I haven't received any announcements for this evening, 
Uh, so we'll quickly go through that. So let me just say that our monthly newsletter magazine can be found on our website, which is liverpoolas.org. Um, and a few astronomical announcements. We have the Geminids meteor shower taking place over the next few nights. And the weather forecast today said it was going to be nice and clear tomorrow. So you might just get a chance to actually see some tomorrow night, which is a, a nice surprise for us here in the UK anyway. Uh, if you're in, if you're living in parts of South America, there's a solar eclipse on the 14th of December. And uh, that starts around about 1.30 p.m. GMT time. So I'm sure it will be um, online somewhere where you can watch it happening online. Um, and we have rather a rare conjunction between Jupiter and Saturn happening from sunset on Monday the 21st of December. And that's the uh, winter solstice. So this is something you should try and observe. Uh, if you Google it, there's plenty of info out there. And we've also put up some help and information on how to observe it on our website also. So try to get to see it because it will be 2080 before the two planets get this close again. Now, um, for the sake of repeating myself, I'll, but I will do in case uh, anybody wasn't on the last meetings and they didn't hear it. This year's society session runs from September 2020 to May 2021 and for those of you that aren't aware this session is free so there's no subs payable or due on this session if however you want to make a charitable contribution <clears throat> to the society then we'll, we'll, we'll happily take it and um, contact myself or Mark Galvin the secretary or Chris Banks the treasurer uh, with your um, generous donation and you can contact them via the contact us on the website now the qmh where we normally hold our meetings is is closed for the foreseeable future our latent observatory at pex hill is also closed and there's no outreach events planned so let's hope we all get through this period in our lives and we can all get together again in the future so meanwhile we'll try and do our best to host online monthly meetings We'll try and do other things online. We also have our Twitter and Facebook group, social media. Plus, Mark sends out regular email updates with society information, astronomy events, and details of anything going on online. So contact Mark via the website again if you wish to be on the distribution list. Um, I just point out that members are already on that list. <clears throat> now, on to our guest speaker. So our guest speaker tonight comes all the way from Hershey in Pennsylvania, and it's Bob Neuer. And he's a well-renowned freelance journalist. He has been editor-in-chief at Sky and Telescope magazine and worked at other scientific publications also. He has written or contributed to many books, has given lectures all over the world, and worked at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Bob and I have become good friends. I first met him and so did a few other society members when he and his traveling partner, Anne Eames, visited Liverpool five years ago. Was it really that long ago? But uh, enough from me, I'm gonna let Bob take over now and I'll tell you, and he'll tell you all about that. So over to you, Bob. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce tonight's guest speaker, Bob Neuer. Bob, I'm going to turn off my sharing and I should be able to hand over to you. Okay, great. And just somewhere, uh, let's see how to. I've lost, can people hear me? Uh oh. Yeah, yes. Bob, I can hear you. Okay, but yeah, I can't, can I, I've lost the screen that would enable me to share my screen. Le oh, oh, there we go. Okay, there we go. I see it now. Okay, this should work. Can people see my screen now, my uh, title slide? Yeah, that's nice. Okay, I'm not seeing it, but it's not important that I see it. What matters is that all of you see it, but you can see my title slide that says, um, 
this is strange. I've never had this happen before. But you can see my slide that says how to find life in the universe. Yep. Okay, yes, great. We can we can see that. Yeah. Okay. I think yeah. we can go ahead I'm, now. I'm getting I'm getting messages on the on the chat that says they can they can hear you and see it. Okay, great. That's I good. think we can uh, we're good thank we're good, you're good to go that. then. Thanks everyone. Uh, so I, I just want to first of all thank Steve Southern and Mark Galvin for setting up this Zoom meeting. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in or Zooming in tonight. Of course, for me, it's about 2.15 in the afternoon. Um, it's a great honor for me to speak to the Liverpool Astronomical Society, which I know has a long and very noble and proud tradition. I'm sorry I can't be there in person with you tonight, but it's great to be able to Zoom in uh, to give this presentation from across the Atlantic Ocean. And why is my, there we go. Um, so I'm not a complete stranger to Liverpool. Um, I visited, as Steve mentioned, I mis visited your great city with my friend Anne for a couple days in April 2015. And Steve was very gracious and gave me and, uh, me and Anne a really wonderful tour of Liverpool. And it was one of my great thrills of my life to be able to watch my favorite Premier League club, Everton, at Goodison Park, where they thrashed Manchester United 3-0. That was just awesome. And why is, there we go. Um, but as Steve knows, and I have to point this out, I now have divided loyalties. I used to really hate Chelsea because uh, I find Jose Mourinho very egomaniac, kind of like our current president. Um, but in the summer of last year, Chelsea bought Christian Pulisic from his German team. Well, he comes from my hometown of Hershey, Pennsylvania, which is, of course, is a town made famous for its chocolate. He grew up in a house that was only about one mile from the house where I grew up. And then just this past Sunday against Leeds, he scored a goal in stoppage time, and that made him the fastest American player, American born player, to score. 10 goals in the Premier League, and he did it in only 30 games. And, um, you know, having this local lad play uh, in the Premier League <clears throat> has enabled me to indulge my long term fantasy of becoming a sports writer. I've been a science journalist for over 30 years, but my local newspaper is letting me write a month or a weekly column about uh, the exploits of Christian Pulisic. So I'm now getting to be a sports writer as well as writing about astronomy and science. Uh, so the big problem for me is that Chelsea and Everton play tomorrow. <clears throat> and I'll be covering that game for our local newspaper. Uh, but I can assure the Everton fans in the audience that I will be rooting for Everton. But I hope Pulisic at least scores a goal. And as Steve knows, I do generally root for Liverpool, except during the Merseyside Derby. So I, I'm sort of a Liverpool fan too. And I know that's hard for people in Liverpool, but from this side of the Atlantic, we don't really feel the intense rivalry the way that people in Liverpool feel it. So enough about football. Uh, so I'm best known for being editor in chief of Sky and Telescope magazine for six years from 2008 to 2014. But from 1995 to 2000, I worked for Astronomy Magazine. I don't know how widely distributed it is in the UK, but in the US, it actually has a larger circulation than Sky and Telescope. They're, so they're kind of competing magazines, and I'm the only person who's worked for a long period of time for both magazines. So the talk I'm giving tonight is based on a cover story that I wrote just a few months ago for the September 2020 issue of Astronomy Magazine, there's also an internet article that you can find for free where I kind of add on to what I discussed in the magazine article. So as I think you all know, my topic for tonight is about how scientists are searching for life on other worlds. And of course that raises <clears throat> very interesting questions about how common life is on other planets, what its nature might be. And scientists have discussed these topics for centuries. 
I mean, even William Herschel back in the late 1700s was wondering if he was seeing cities on the moon. Uh, so the public, of course, is very keenly interested in this topic as well. Think about like the popularity of science fiction stories and movies. They're some of the most uh, you know, popular movies that have ever been created and watched and loved. But what I find interesting is despite the fact there's been all this interest and speculation, this field of astrobiology, I liken it to string theory in that it's, it's a science whose, so, whose subject matter has not yet been proven to exist. So what I'm hoping is that, you know, in my lifetime, we're going to turn this theoretical topic into an observational science. So scientists have very good reason to be optimistic that life is common in our galaxy. And obviously, if it's common in our galaxy, it's going to be all over the universe, too. Uh, I think one of the big reasons for optimism is when scientists look at the very oldest preserved rocks, like this one uh, in Greenland, which dates back 3.8 billion years, they find either chemical or a little bit more recently fossilized evidence for life. So we know that life was existed on Earth when it was less than 20% of its current age. <clears throat> and that gives at least some reason for optimism that life will get started if conditions are right, meaning liquid water, organic molecules, and flows of energy. And as many of you all know, I mean, our Milky Way galaxy has roughly 200 billion stars. We know from surveys for exoplanets that there's an average of at least one planet per star. So I, I think it's actually very safe to conclude that our galaxy ha has several hundred billion planets, maybe as many as a trillion. And then when you include moons, there's literally just, you know, an enormous astronomical number of potentially life bearing worlds just in our galaxy alone. And another reason for optimism is when, you know, I'm sure all of you have seen the Orion Nebula, you can see it naked eye you know, it's a nice binocular and a great telescopic object, is it is just brimming with elements such as, you know, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus that are essential for life on Earth. So this means that our galaxy is richly endowed with the ingredients for life. But I would argue that it's very dangerous to draw very strong scientific conclusions from just a single example of a phenomenon. For example, I don't think this is likely, but we cannot rule out the possibility that the origin of life on Earth was just a once in a universe miracle, or maybe that we're lucky that life has endured for billions of years on our planet as the planet has experienced profound changes in its atmospheric chem chemistry and surface temperature. It's gone from several hothouse phases, like during the Jurassic period, but it's also gone, th gone through snow snowball phases where it's been frozen almost entirely to the equator. Uh, and yet life has survived all of that. Um, and you know, life has evolved from very primitive single-celled or organisms all the way to very complex, you know, creatures like hum humans and kangaroos. So we don't know for certain, you know, which of these events and processes on Earth are typical and atypical of planets in general. So we, we really, I don't think we know with absolute certainty whether there is life out there. So as, I, as I'm going to talk about tonight, my hope is that scientists will turn this um, you know, kind of theoretical question and turn astrobiology into an, an observational science. And they're really taking three different roads or approaches to how to search for extraterrestrial life. So you can see the road branching off to the left is explore the solar system. Number two is to probe the atmospheres of planets orbiting other stars, which I will call exoplanets. And then the third and maybe the most exciting road is to actually search 
for other advanced technological civilizations. I'm sure many of you have read about SETI, but there's another way to do it that I'll be talking about near the end, and that's the search for what I call techno signatures, signatures of other technology out in our galaxy. Now, I kind of am framing this as three different roads, but I want to stress this is not like a race or a competition. I just put, think of it as we're putting our eggs in more than one basket. And because we don't know how common life is, we don't know how easy to, it will be to find, we don't really know which of these approaches will be the first to uh, make a discovery or bear fruit. But I, I'm guessing it'll happen in the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, I'm 57. I certainly hope and expect uh, that we will have the first detection of extraterrestrial life in my lifetime. But what is it that we're looking for? Uh, you know, and this is a complex question. I mean, I've read books on this topic and there's no agreed upon consensus definition of what is life. Um, and on Earth, as this slide shows, we see an incredible variety of life. I mean, microbes can exist in an incredible range of environments. I mean, they can exist in the dry valleys of Antarctica. Steve and I were talking a few days ago, they can exist in subsurface lakes under Antarctica. They can exist in acidic hot springs. They can exist in the crushing depths of the deep ocean. And then when you look at macroscopic life, I mean, it's all over the map and it fills like every, almost every conceivable environmental niche. I mean, almost anywhere you look on earth, you find life. And by the way, that cat is our former fa family cat. And I just had to make a joke here that he, he's yawning because he's bored after watching a game involved Jose Mourinho. Um, but what about life on other planets? I mean, this is a huge unknown. There could be life supporting environments on our other worlds that are totally unlike anything we have here on Earth. So, and I'll give astrobiologists and also science fiction writers credit for being very broad minded in their thinking about extraterrestrial life. I mean, given our ignorance of all, you know, the possible life forms that can be out there, we can't resolve these burning questions about life beyond Earth through calculations or theoretical speculations. We don't know who or what is out there, so we need to observe and explore, and that's what I'll be talking about tonight. Now, some of you might be thinking, didn't scientists recently announce the discovery of life on Venus? So if you remember, back in mid-September, there was an international team of astronomers led by Jane Greaves of Cardiff University in Wales, obviously in the UK. And this team announced that it had used two different radio telescopes, one in Hawaii and one in Chile, to detect the molecule phosphine in Venus's thick atmosphere. This is a molecule consisting of one atom of phosphorus and three of hydrogen. So this slide shows the spectral signature of phosphine from the two telescopes uh, with an image of Venus in the background. And you can see in the middle here, there are steep dips that are the two of these spectral lines, the result of phosphine molecules in Venus's atmosphere blocking waves, microwaves, at a specific wavelength as associated with this molecule. But I want to make this very clear, and the team did as well. They were very responsible in their announcement. They did not claim that they had dis detected life on Venus. And here's the, 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 the conundrum, is that Earth has trace levels of phosphine gas in our atmosphere, and it's produced entirely by microbes and by human industrial activity. So on Earth, phosphine is associated with biological processes. Now the team did all these studies trying to think of different ways to produce phosphine with the known chemicals in Venus's atmosphere and at the layer in the atmosphere about 30 to 40 miles high, what we know about the conditions there. And there are very temperate conditions there by, or even by Earth standards with mild temperatures. 
and they couldn't come up with any conceivable non-biological explanation for the phosphine. So, and you can go back even as far back as the 1960s, Carl Sagan and other astronomers have speculated that there could be microbial life in the atmosphere of Venus. But I wanna really make this clear, the clouds at that altitude consist mostly of sulfuric acid and there's no water there. So if there is life in this temperate zone in Venus's atmosphere, it is very, very different from life on Earth. Um, more, moreover, other teams have since, over the last couple months, have re-examined the data and either not found the phosphine signal or found a much weaker signal. So I think this even the detection of phosphine is being questioned. So therefore, I want to make it clear the team has not even come close to proving that microbes are circulating in Venus's atmosphere. So basically what we have is the possible detection of phosphine without an explanation for what is producing it, if it in fact is there. So I'm skeptical about this claim, but I do not completely dismiss the possibility. And I would hope that someday NASA or ESA or another space agency will fly a mission to Venus's clouds and try to study this in person or not in person, but by robotically to really answer this question, what's, what's and for all. And I found this really cool piece of artwork uh, on Google uh, of a future space robotic airplane or glider. It looks like it has propellers, so it's an airplane uh, exploring the clouds in Venus's atmosphere, but it better be sturdily built so it can survive being, you know, flying through clouds made of sulfuric acid. So now I'm gonna turn our attention to Mars. And of course, Mars periodically comes, comes close to Earth, making it relatively easy to observe like it has been for the last several months and to reach with spacecraft. Um, and so amateurs over the last few months have been taking really amazing images. And the best ones I've seen come from your compatriot, uh, Damon, Damian Peach, who I regard as at the very cutting edge of amateur planetary astrophotography, and he's been so for many, many years. Um, so for centuries, many people assumed that Mars was inhabited either by abundant vegetation or even intelligent beings and civilizations. But NASA sent several spacecraft to, v to Mars in the late 60s and 70s. The first few missions were Mariner flyby missions, and then with, uh, with Viking, they put uh, Mariner 9 and Viking, they put spacecraft in orbit around, the, around Mars that took these wonderful images of the surface. Now, the bad news is, is that, you know, you look at the surface from orbit and there's no hint of life. You know, the surface is cold, it's dry, it's barren, no obvious sign of life. But look in these orbiter photos, you know, and these come from the 70s at fairly low resolution, you can easily see features that look like dried up riverbeds here on Earth. So this was very powerful evidence that at some time in Mars's distant past, probably three to four billion years ago, you know, liquid water was flowing on the surface. Um, and that raised hopes that maybe life got started and that maybe even if there's not life on the surface right now, over time it would have retreated underground, just like we see a lot of underground life on Earth right now. So in 1976, uh, NASA was able to land two Viking landers on the surface of Mars. And these were the first successful landings on Mars after several failed Soviet attempts I remember as a seven-year-old watching the television coverage of the first Viking One lander, and that was an event that really helped stimulate my interest in astronomy. So on the left, we see a model of a Viking rover or a Viking lander, and on the right, we see an image from the Viking One lander. That big rock off to the left is called Big Joe, 
And it's a good thing the lander did not come down on top of Big Joe or else it would have probably uh, destroyed the mission. Um, so both spacecraft carried mechanical arms that could scoop up soil samples and bring them inside the lander. And then each, each lander, and they were about 4,000 miles apart on opposite sides of Mars. They each conducted three experiments to see if you could expose this Martian material to water and nutrients and to see if there were microbes that would metabolize that uh, you know, these nutrients and then give off gas that would indicate the presence of life. Well, lo and behold, one of the experiments actually, and it's to this day, its results were 100% consistent with life on Mars. The other two experiments, however, came up negative, and there was an instrument on, Vi on each Viking lander to look for organic compounds and it didn't find any, although later Mars la rovers and landers have found organic compounds on Mars. So most scientists interpret these Viking results as that the positive result from the labeled release experiment was due to some kind of active chemical agent in the Martian soil. Uh, but there's still scientists to this day who believe that Viking detected life on Mars back in 1976. And despite NASA's claims to the contrary, NASA has never sent a dedicated life ex detection experiment to Mars to follow up these tantalizing results. And in a couple minutes, the Europeans have taken up that challenge. There's another tantalizing hint of life on Mars, and I'm sure many of you remember the big news story in uh, 1996, when a team of scientists at NASA, Johnson Space Center, and Stanford University announced that it had found signs of possible life inside this Mars meteorite called ALH84001. Um, even President Bill Clinton at the time attended the press conference. So they claimed that they had found several chemical signatures of past life on Mars. And you can see on the right, there's this electron microscope image that they even found these worm-like structures that resemble nanobacteria on Earth. So this would have been life that existed billions of years ago, not life today, but long, long ago. Now these claims are mostly most scientists don't accept them as evidence for life on Mars because all of these different signatures I mentioned can also be produced by geological or chemical processes. But that doesn't mean they were. In my view, this is not proof of life on Mars. You could argue it's evidence, but I don't think we wanna completely dismiss it either. But then there's something that's much more recent and this comes from both telescopic observations from Earth and measurements from the surface of Mars from NASA's Curiosity rover. They have detected trace amounts of methane or CH4 in Mars's thin atmosphere. Uh, and, this, and as you can see in this graph here, the level of methane in the atmosphere rises and falls with the seasons, rises in the spring and summer, falls in the autumn and winter. Now, if you look at Earth, 95% of the methane in Earth's atmosphere has a biological origin. But once again, there's a number of non-biological processes, just regular geology and chemistry doing their thing that can produce methane. <clears throat> so the origin of this Martian methane remains unresolved. But more recently, uh, a spectrometer on Curiosity has found oxygen, O2, the kind of stuff we're breathing right now. Once again, like the methane, it's rising and falling with the seasons. And on Earth, essentially all the O2 in Earth's atmosphere is biological in origin. So here we see, you know, detections of two potential biomarker gases 
in in Mars's atmosphere, like right now. Uh, so we don't know. We don't know whether this methane and oxygen is coming from biology or whether it's, com it's coming from geology or chemistry. So on July 30th of this year, NASA launched its next Mars rover called Perseverance, or they call it Percy for short. I'm going to call it Percy. And here we just see a really nice artist rendering of Percy on the, marsh, of, on the Martian soil. Uh, it's going to be landing on or crashing, hopefully landing on February 18th of next year in this fairly sizable crater called Jezero. And it's going to land in this color, this is false color, uh, an area uh, that was once a delta, uh, a, you know, one of these river deltas. So this rover should be encountering a lot of rocks that formed in liquid water. Now, NASA is touting Percy as a life detecting mission, but the honest truth, and several lead NASA scientists told me that it really isn't. It's not carrying any instruments that are really specifically designed to look for life, but it could conceivably find mineral mineralogical signatures of minerals that formed uh, in the presence of life. There's several dozen minerals on Earth that can only exist or only have formed in life. So it's conceivable it could find evidence for life, but it wasn't really designed for that. But more important, it will collect rock and soil samples for later return to Earth. And I'll return to that topic shortly, but I now wanna move on to your rover, the European Space Agency's Mars rover named Rosalind Franklin, uh, who was, you know, she was a great British scientist whose X-ray imaging in the 1950s made it possible for James Watson and Francis Crick in 1953 to discover the DNA, that DNA has a double helix structure. And I, I, my guess is a lot of you know this, but Rosalind Franklin was a brilliant scientist and dedicated scientist who did not receive the credit she deserved during her relatively short lifetime. She died in her 30s of cancer. So I was really delighted when ESA decided to name its Mars rover after her. And uh, Rosalind Franklin was mostly built at the British Division of Airbus, Airbus Defense and Space in Stevenage, not that far from where you all live. Now it weighs 300 kilograms. It was original, so it's a little bit smaller than these recent NASA rovers. It was originally scheduled to launch earlier this year, uh, but there were problems with the parachute testing and then the pandemic hit. So ESA decided to withhold the launch and wait until late 2022. Um, but I do wanna say, I think Rosalind Franklin has a better chance than Percy of finding evidence for life on Mars. So on the 10th of June, 2023, the rover will land, you can see the spot here marked blue, in an ancient Martian lake bed known as Oxia Planum. And this is a site, you know, right, right in an area where they think there was once liquid water. And the orbital data suggests that the rocks there should be really good, have a high potential for uh, preserving, uh, preserving like the quality of these ancient rocks. You know, there should be good preservation. So the rover will be controlled from the Rover Operations Control Center in Turin, Italy. And it's expected to travel several kilometers uh, during its mission. And the ESA Trace Gas Orbiter spacecraft, which is orbiting Mars right now, will help relay communications to and from Earth. So the rover carries a drill and a suite of cameras and scientific instruments. So the cameras, of course, are gonna look for morphological signs of biological activity in the rocks. For example, maybe it could find textures like stromatolites, like we see in Western Australia, but which dated back billions of years. These are microbial colonies. You know, so the cameras could see evidence of life, 
Although if I think if stromatolites or something analogous was common on Mars, the NASA landers and rovers probably would have seen that already. But the drill can go down two meters, and that's the deepest we will ever have dug on Mars. And it can bring up material from two meters deep. And that's really important because at that depth, the Martian material is going to be protected from the ravages of ultraviolet radiation and surface oxidation. So this material is going to be brought inside the rover. It's then going to be crushed into a powder and then heated. And there's going to be a laser spectrometer and a mass spectrometer that's then going to analyze this released gas for signs of organic compounds and a variety of biosignatures that would be indicative of past or current life. Now, this is from a paper that I sent Steve a couple days ago, uh, a paper that was published a couple years ago in the journal Astrobiology, and the authors are scientists on this rover team. And what they do is they list a, a, a group of potential biosignatures and it would take too long and I don't really fully understand everything. So I'm not going to go through them one by one, but you can see they have numbers to the right where they they come up with a scoring system to say, how convincing would it be if we found this for life on Mars, if we found this particular biosignature. Now, the one that I've arrowed and it's pronounced enantiometric excess, um, what that means, and, and my, my astrobiology expert that I asked about this, Christopher McKay at NASA Ames Research Center, he basically said that what this is based on the fact that on Earth, we know that there are 500 or so naturally occurring amino acids that are involved in making proteins, but only 20 of these 500 are involved in terrestrial life. And these amino acids can come in two different shapes, one called left-handed and one called right-handed. Well, all of the ones on earth involved in life, we only see them in the left-handed variety. So he told me in an email just a few days ago, he said, this is, and this is an exact quote from his email, this is a remarkable signature of biological selectivity, both the 20 and the common handedness. So if Rosalind Franklin were to see something like that on Mars, that you only see certain, a small subset of amino acids and all either left-handed or right-handed, that would be very compelling evidence for life. Maybe not proof, but very compelling evidence. So in this paper, the authors state the ultimate confirmation of a collection of protect, potential temp biosignature detections may require more thorough analyses than can be performed with our present robotic means. So they're admitting they probably won't find proof of life on Mars, but they might, you know, they might find really, really compelling evidence. So I find that I find it to be a very, very exciting mission. And I really want to applaud ESA and, of course, with a lot of UK involvement for flying this very bold mission. I hope it's a resounding success techni technically, because uh, obviously landing a, and operating a rover on another planet is not an easy thing to do. So a couple minutes ago, I mentioned sample return, and I mentioned that NASA's Perseverance rover will be collecting samples. So NASA and ESA are planning a joint mission to return these samples to Earth in the early 2030s. And as Steve very well knows, and he and I are very much in agreement on this, I am a firm proponent in transatlantic cooperation in space exploration, but in many other areas as well. So one of the science team members for Percy, Jim Bell at Arizona State University, said that in his mind, the rover's mission won't be complete until its samples are returned to Earth. So in the current planning, 
is NASA is going to provide a vehicle, a rover, that will fetch the samples collected by Percy and then have a rocket that will launch them into Mars orbit. And then ESA will provide the vehicle that will rendezvous, collect this these samples, and then rocket them back to Earth. Well, this is obviously going to be an extraordinarily challenging mission technologically. But if NASA and ESA working together can pull this off, and I, you know, I would say they'll probably get it to work, given that you know NASA and ESA have tremendous successful track records with space exploration. So my guess is the mission will work and we're going to get samples back sometime like 15, 20 years from now. Um, we're going to have Martian samples from a known location on Mars that scientists can then study in our best laboratories on Earth. And if let's say they find living microbes or fossilized microbes, that'll answer the question once and for all. Obviously, that would be a great discovery. But let's say the mission comes up empty. That doesn't prove that Mars never had life or doesn't have life right now. It would just say these samples don't contain evidence for life. It might require future human explorers who can dig down into these underground lakes and aquifers, hydrothermal areas, locations that we think are most likely to harbor life. And I would argue that it might even require a sustained human exploration over, you know, human colonization and exploration over many years to determine whether Mars is a living or dead planet. And by the way, I really like this piece of art because it shows two children on Mars. Why not? Um, now, finding evidence for life on Mars would be an incredible discovery. Now, if we can find out like its genetic makeup, chemical makeup, and we can find that it has some kind of evolutionary linkage to terrestrial life, that would imply that life originated on one planet and was transported to the other inside a meteorite like ALH84001, or that both planets were seeded from a common outside source. That would be in itself a remarkable discovery. But let's say Martian life is completely different. Let's say it uses different amino acids, or let's say it uses right-handed amino acids, or uses some molecule other than DNA to encode genetic information. That would tell us that life almost certainly originated independently on two different worlds. Now you have two different worlds, each independently originated life. Well, we've got hundreds of billions of worlds in, the, in our galaxy. I think that would tell us that there is an enormous number of worlds in our galaxy that have life because it would definitely tell us that life will get started wherever conditions are favorable. So I now want to move on to the outer solar system and turn my attention to the icy moons. And I'm going to start with uh, Jupiter's fourth largest moon, Europa, which we see on the left here. And I also have it arrowed on the right compared in size with the other three large Jupiter moons along with Earth and our moon. Now from Europa's bulk density, it suggests that it has, we know it has a very thick icy crust, but the bulk density suggests that underneath that icy crust, there's a, a liquid water layer beneath it. And when the, the Voyager 1 and 2 flew by in 1979, they saw that its icy surface is crisscrossed with these dark streaks, which seem to indicate that there's water seeping up from the interior and onto the surface. And more recently, ga the Galileo spacecraft that NASA put into orbit around Jupiter in 1995 discovered that Europa has an induced magnetic field indicating that this subsurface ocean has a lot of salt mixed in with it, like the oceans on Earth. And better yet, there are spectrometers on Galileo that discover that there is organic matter on the surface of Europa. So 
if all that sounds very promising, you better believe it. Um, and it's gotten even better. Um, or actually, I, I, I jumped the head one. Uh, it's gotten even better. Um, scientists studying images, both from the Hubble Space Telescope, like the one we see here, but also archival data from the Galileo mission have discovered that there are plumes shooting off from the surface of Galileo, and they appear to be ma mainly water. Uh, we don't know if they come from the surface or from deeper down from the watery layer. But all of this is once again, very, very powerful evidence that there is a subsurface ocean of water right below the surface. And here's a model of, uh, of Europa, and it's now thought, and I think the evidence is very strong, that this ocean holds considerably more water than all of the oceans and all of the water in Earth's oceans combined. And the bulk density suggests that beneath this water layer is a rocky layer. So just like Earth, this water ocean would be in contact with, with a, a layer below, a rocky layer below. And uh, Europa is also tidally heated as it's orbiting Jupiter. It's being tugged upon by Jupiter and the other three large moons that squeezes and flexes the interior. So there's energy there, a lot of energy. So Europa has all the ingredients for life as we know it, as life as we have it here on Earth, liquid water, organic molecules, and energy. So it's not at all difficult to imagine that Europa has something analogous to hydrothermal vents on its seafloor, just like the ones on Earth. And the ones at the bottom of the Atlantic and Pacific and Indian Oceans, these hydrothermal vents fuel, you know, the vents themselves are oozing in minerals and they fuel com very complex ecosystems, lots of different kinds of life in the complete absence of sunlight. So it is not at all difficult to imagine this is also going on on Europa. So NASA is planning a mission in the early 2030s called Europa Clipper. Now it's gonna orbit Jupiter, but it's gonna be put in an orbit where it's gonna make 44 close flybys of Europa. It's gonna image the entire surface at high resolution, measure the thickness of the ice so scientists can uh, figure out where it might be relatively thin, give us more information about the surface composition, and maybe even fly through these plumes and measure their composition. And not to be outdone, uh, ESA is planning its own orbiter called Juicy Icy Moons Explorer or JUICE. It's gonna go into orbit around Jupiter in 2029, and eventually it's gonna go into orbit around Ganymede, the largest moon in the solar system. So Europa is considered a secondary, secondary target, but there's still gonna be two close flybys. And from these flybys, we're gonna still learn a lot more about uh, Galileo, like its surface composition, about its geology. Uh, so I think you know, we're gonna learn a lot more from these, uh, these missions about Europa's biological potential. And I'm hoping that someday that these two, that JUICE and Europa Clipper will pave the way for a future lander, perhaps a mission jointly planned by NASA and ESA. And we, it'll land on the surface, look for the signs of life on the surface, but more important, put some kind of melting device or drill to kind of punch through this icy layer and directly probe this icy layer and look for signs of life. This mission is, you know, probably at least 20 years away, but I hope someday we get to we get to do this mission. I just want to mention briefly that there is at least a dozen other of these ice shell worlds in the outer solar system that might have substantial water oceans. This includes Saturn's moon Enceladus that we see here, and even Pluto. But as of now, there aren't any planned missions to these other worlds. So I'm not gonna talk about them anymore tonight. 
But there is one other solar system body I want to discuss, and that's Saturn's large moon Titan, which is the only uh, moon in the solar system with a thick atmosphere. And both in terms of pressure and composition, this atmosphere has many similarities to Earth's atmosphere. Uh, but more interestingly, is Titan has lakes and rivers <clears throat> on the surface where the liquid is made of a mixture of methane and ethane and not water. So these are organic compounds, but the surface temperature on Titan is minus 179 degrees Celsius, which is probably too cold for life as we know it. But NASA has approved and is working on an incredibly exciting rotor craft. Think of it as a mini robotic helicopter. And it's a mission called Dragonfly that's going to fly in, in Titan's thick atmosphere and explore the surface from multiple locations with a suite of instruments. So in the current plan, it's going to launch in April 2026 and uh, reach Titan in December 2034. 14 years from now. So technologically, this is an incredibly challenging mission, but it could conceivably find evidence for life if there is life there, or, and if there is life there, it's gonna be life 2.0. It's gonna be very different from life on Earth because of Titan's very different chemistry. So, but even if it doesn't find evidence of life, it might help us better understand the organic chemistry that leads to life. Let me just take a quick hit of water. So I'm now gonna move to the second road and the, these last two sections will go a lot faster. Uh, I'm gonna now talk about extrasolar planets or exoplanets. And I checked this morning, exoplanet.eu is my go-to website. And currently we know of 4,000 379 planets outside the solar system. That is 547 times as many planets as we have found inside the solar system that is orbiting the sun. And as I mentioned earlier, our galaxy undoubtedly has hundreds of billions of planets, uh, maybe even up to a trillion, but the closest one orbiting Proxima Centauri is 4.2 light years away. That's 25 trillion miles. So we're not going to be exploring them up close anytime soon. So uh, you might be wondering, how can we find signs of life? Well, the earliest, easiest planets to study with current technology are those whose orbits line up with Earth's line of sight so that the planet crosses in front of its host star every time it goes around. That it's sort of like the transits of, of that I've, of Venus and Mercury. I actually got lucky and saw both transit of the, transits of Venus. So uh, I'm, I'm assuming many of you have also seen these transits. So as the planet crosses in front of its star, it produces a tiny drop because it's in the, the brightness of the star because it's blocking some of its light. And so these periodic transits give away the existence of the planet. And most of these 4,000 some planets that we know of were found by the transit uh, method, mostly by NASA's Kepler mission. Now, as this light, uh, the, the starlight passes through the star's upper atmosphere or the planet's upper atmosphere during a transit, the molecules and atoms in the upper atmosphere of the planet absorb or deflect some of that starlight, making it fainter at these specific wavelengths. And that shows up in the spectrum of the star, which are like fingerprints that identify the chemical composition of these gases in the upper atmosphere of the planets. So astronomers using the Hubble Space Telescope and also several ground-based telescopes have used this method to detect signatures such as water vapor and carbon dioxide in the atmospheres of other planets. 
So here we see the spectral signatures of Venus, Earth, and Mars, as would be observed by, let's say, a civilization with advanced telescopes on a planet, let's say, 40 light years from Earth. They would look at Earth, for example, and see this, these two, this very deep absorption line for O3, which is oxygen three or ozone. And that would immediately capture their interest because oxygen is a very reactive gas. Without photosynthesis, which of course is a biological process, oxygen would disappear from Earth in you know geologically a very short period of time so they would see that in combination with the water vapor and the co2 or carbon dioxide and they would say this is a very very interesting planet worth fo follow-up study <clears throat> a planet that could conceivably have evidence you know could have life they, they would actually probably consider it very likely this planet has life they would compare that to Venus and Mars, which are dominated, by, who have atmospheres dominated by CO2. Now, there are many, many different processes, especially volcanism, that have nothing to do with biology that produce CO2. So they would be much less interested in Venus and Mars. They would be particularly interested, too, of Earth if they could build even better telescopes to detect the methane is that the methane and oxygen are not in equilibrium with each other. And that would be a sign, even a better sign of life on Earth. So astronomers, as I mentioned, have already used this method doing spec taking spectra of planets as they transit their stars. They've discovered dozens of chemicals and exoplanet atmospheres. But astronomers agree it's gonna take the next generation of telescopes to really find biosignatures at a level where you would find the detection to be truly compelling. The good news is that this next generation of telescopes is right around the corner, starting with NASA's James Webb Te Space Telescope, which is gonna launch less than a year from now on an ESA Ariane 5 rocket from French Guiana off the coast of South America. So it's going to have a six and a half meter mirror, more than twice the diameter of Hubble's mirror, and it'll be optimized for infrared observations so it could reveal chemicals like water, ozone, methane, and carbon dioxide in the atmospheres of transiting exoplanets. One of its first targets will be a star about 40 light years away called TRAPPIST-1, which has seven known transiting planets, all of which are about the same size of Earth. Now you need to look really carefully. These planets are orbiting very, very close to the star. You can see where it says enlarged 25 times. Well, this star <clears throat> is a red dwarf. So it puts out a feeble amount of light. So the planets E, F, and G are actually in the habitable zone of TRAPPIST-1. So, I mean, conceivably, one or more of those planets, you know, water, liquid water could be stable on their surfaces and they could have life. So, international consortiums are now also building three giant land-based telescopes pictured here, all of which are expected to come on online later this decade. So, we have the 30-meter telescope, the giant Magellan telescope, and the European Extremely Large Telescope, all of which will have primary mirrors 25 to 40 meters in diameter. And they're gonna be equipped with state-of-the-art instruments. And most of the astronomers that I've talked to say that they can actually do this experiment better than JWST can, but because they're on the surface, they're gonna be optimized for visible light observations so they're going to look for things like oxygen two, oxygen three, and water vapor. If life is common in the galaxy, there's a decent chance that one or more of these telescopes will detect these biosignatures. And then scientists are working on even better telescopes that'll use an advanced coronagraph 
to block out the blot out the light of this of the host star, which outshines planets by roughly a million to one, <clears throat> depending on the wavelength. So you can cut out the star's glare, makes it much easier to study the planet, and then suddenly you're not limited to just transiting planets. You can image and take spectra of planets that don't cross in front of the star. Uh, so this is one called ELF or ExoLife Finder. That'll be a 20 to meter, 20 to 30 meter telescope. And it'll be able to take really detailed measurements of the chemistry of exoplanet atmospheres and even image clouds and surface features uh, and you know like oceans and continents on the surfaces of other planets. So Exo Life Finder probably could tell us whether life is common in the galaxy. One of its targets will be the inner known planet of two planets known to orbit Proxima Centauri, the closest star. This is a world that's slightly more massive than Earth, but once again, like those three planets around TRAPPIST-1, it's orbiting a red dwarf, and it's actually right in the middle of Proxima's habitable zone at a distance of about 1 20th of an astronomical unit. Uh, last but not least, uh, astronomers would yearn to put a large space-based telescope that's really optimized for exoplanet studies. So NASA is currently studying this mission called Louvoir uh, that would launch sometime in the 2030s that would dwarf even uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. And if this thing is built, we will get detailed information about hundreds of exoplanets within a few maybe hundred light years of Earth. This thing would definitely answer the question of whether or not life is common in the galaxy. But this is going to be a very expensive mission. So I would say that politics more than science will determine whether this gets built. So now I've reached the final part of my talk, which is SETI or the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. But I'm also going to talk about techno signatures, which are signs of advanced civilizations that are modifying their planets or space environments in ways that our telescopes could detect. Now, since the early 1960s, astronomers have been using radio telescopes and arrays to search for radio signals from advanced civilizations. Um, but in recent years, these SETI projects are piggybacking on radio observations of normal astronomical sources, such as stars and pulsars and galaxies. Currently, the most advanced SETI project is called Breakthrough Listen, which is funded by this tech billionaire at the upper left, uh, Yuri Bil Milner, who's giving it $100 million over a 10-year life uh, uh, lifetime. So these two telescopes, and I, I took both of these photographs. I've had the uh, pleasure of visiting both of them. Um, have been scanning the skies for signs of extraterrestrial signals. Uh, the project <clears throat> recently rela released data on 300,000 stars. So far, there's no, no confirmed detection. Uh, but, you know, if uh, there's other civilizations are common, this is one method. If they're sending out radio signals, these uh, telescopes could could potentially detect them. The searches are getting better with better receivers and equipment. So the searches, the technology is getting better. So the chances keep getting better and better with time of radio SETI. But there's other, several other groups that are searching for powerful pulse laser signals transmitted by other civilizations. This is a field known as optical SETI. Uh, the leading group right now is based at the University of California at San Diego, led by Shelley Wright, and her group is developing these uh, observatories called Pano SETI. There'll be two in the Northern Hemisphere, two in the other, other Hemisphere that are going to be like all sky surveys 
around the clock as Earth rotates, looking for pulse laser signals lasting a billionth of a second long or less, which would be a clear sign of artificial origin. These will hopefully come online in the next several years. But I'm gonna make the argument, and I don't know if I'll convince many of you or not, but that if we ever discover extraterrestrial intelligence, I predict it will not be through a purposeful SETI project involving these radio or laser searches. I'm gonna put my money on a serendipitous discovery of a techno signature. So I want you to consider all eight objects shown in this slide. All of them were things, phenomenon and objects that were discovered serendipitously by astronomers who, were who found it, these things when they weren't looking for it, like William Herschel discovered Uranus. Well, he was doing a sky survey. He was not looking for a new planet beyond Saturn, but he discovered Uranus. So what the lesson here is that a lot of the most important things we've ever discovered in astronomy have come serendipitously when our observing techniques or technology has crossed a threshold that's brought a new type of object into view. So, you know, you know, I'm basing my prediction on several premises, but I consider them quite reasonable. The first is that I'm presuming that it's possible for the evolution of life on other planets in our galaxy to produce civilizations that can go on to develop technology. After all, it happened here on Earth. It took a long time, but it did happen, and we're proof of that. If it happened here, it can happen elsewhere. Second, I'm assuming that some of these civilizations will survive their technological adolescence. They won't blow themselves up in a nuclear war or ruin their planet's environment, which we appear to be on the course of doing. And so once they get past that, 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 air, that level, some of them are gonna venture out into space and really start exploring and colonizing space in a big way. Uh, and, and that's what we see here in this slide. We're seeing a, a, a civilization that's put a colony in orbit around the black hole, tapping the energy of the material falling into a black hole, which is an enormous amount of energy. Uh, so we're not able to do this right now, but who's to say that other civilizations won't develop this capability? They might be helped out by artificial intelligence, <clears throat> you know, which we're in the process of developing right now. Um, so consider a civilization, you know, these civilizations might be, you know, millions of years ahead of us, you know, with millions of years of technological development. So they're going to be able to do things that, you know, that we can only dream of right now. And that's why I th find this, this field really interesting is because it sort of forces us to think about like looking into the very, very distant future. For example, here's a, a city, you know, an alien city on, a, on another planet. What would it look like? This is kind of imaginative artwork. Now this ELF telescope that I talked to you a few minutes ago would actually be able to detect the thermal signature of cities. Like for example, if you took Liverpool and put it on a planet like 50 light years from Earth, when its night side is rotated into view from Earth's perspective, ELF could see the thermal signature of Liverpool. It could also detect gases uh, like chlorofluorocarbons that uh, would be artificially produced. So these are the kinds of things we could find in the not too distant future. Uh, the great British American physicist Freeman Dyson, who died earlier this year at age 97, uh, he popularized the idea that a very advanced civilization, once again, way beyond where we are right now, could put spherical, a spherical swarm of space colonies in orbit around its star to capture most of the radiant energy of its host star which of course is enormous. You could 
you know, you could, you know, do a civilization with, mil you know, billions and billions and billions of people if we have that kind of energy source at our disposal. So as Dyson pointed out, that type of structure is going to give off heat, which astronomers could detect as infrared radiation. And astronomers have actually studied infrared data of stars and either and even of entire galaxies to see if they can find signs of Dyson spheres or other lar large scale alien structures. So this is just one of many types of techno signatures that we could possibly detect with current or near future telescopes. And this might sound a little off the wall, but we might not even have to look into deep space to find evidence of another civilization. So consider a civilization that arose several billion years ago, endured for billions of years, developed interstellar travel. And then let's say they sent probes and they went through the solar system. Maybe they left something behind. Now you're, you're a great science fiction writer. In fact, my favorite science fiction writer, Arthur C. Clarke, Imagine this very possibility back in the 1960s, leading to his novel and the movie, 2001, A Space Colony. So we have barely explored the other worlds of our solar system. So once we, if we send colonists there someday and really start exploring them in detail, who knows what we might find? It's even possible that an advanced civilization arose on Earth many billions of years ago, uh, millions of years ago, this is an idea known as the Silurian hypothesis. And there was a recent paper published in the journal Astrobiology, and that's a very respected referee journal that showed that let's say 100 million years ago, when the dinosaurs were roaming Earth, if there was a civilization there would be almost no signs of it today because plate tectonics and also wind and water erosion would erase almost all signs of that civilization. So today, today it would be very difficult to detect. So the fact that we have not detected a past Earth civilization does not mean that one did not exist. I think it's very unlikely, but we can't rule it out. I have to take a little a swipe here at Manchester United. And uh, last but not least, if these ideas are not too far out for you, very, very brilliant people have put forth the idea that humans could be living in the computer simulation of a super advanced civilization with almost infinite computational resources. Uh, this was a concept popularized in the Matrix science fiction trilogy, and brilliant minds are actually right now trying to come up with ideas to test this hypothesis. Now, I'm skeptical that we live in a computer simulation. I believe our world is real, but I don't completely dismiss the idea. But then the idea occurred to me and to other people, let's say we can prove that we are just part of a big computer simulation, will the simulators then decide to pull the plug and end our existence? So I wanna just conclude by saying that the discovery of another civilization would be a major event for humanity. If that civilization is far more advanced than we are, which is highly probable, it would give us reason for optimism that relatively primitive civilizations like ours can survive their technological adolescence. It might also answer the question of whether we have a bio or post biological future where we merge with artificial intelligence or even eventually get replaced by artificial intelligence and you know, our descendants will be machines rather than biology. And, you know, and just the confirmation of another civilization, I think, would have profound ramifications in ways we can't predict, even if, you know, or especially if we get detailed information. But even just finding evidence of, you know, primitive extraterrestrial life would be fascinating. It would give us more insight into our own origins, 
what kind of planets and environments can support life. And I think really interestingly, whether alternative life forms might be possible. And let's say we go decades and decades, we explore Mars and Europa, find no evidence for life. These giant telescopes find no evidence for life on exoplanets. Even a negative result would be interesting because it would suggest that life is relatively rare, which I think would make it more precious. And maybe that would help motivate us to take better care of our own life-bearing planet. So no matter what we find or don't find, I think the search for life on other worlds will tell us a lot about ourselves and our place in this wondrous universe. So I want to thank all of you for listening. Uh, here are four recent books that I highly recommend. I read all four of these uh, while I was researching my article. I actually read an earlier ver edition of the book on the far right. And I just want to mention that the two books on the right uh, were written by British authors. In fact, I believe Keith Cooper is the uh, editor of Astronomy Now magazine, a great magazine. And Stephen Webb is, I believe at the moment, he's a physicist at the University of Portsmouth uh, right there in the UK. So thank you very much. And as I understand it, we'll take a short break and we'll be back in a few minutes. Bob, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Yep, okay. Thank you, uh, fascinating talk. Okay, folks, we're gonna take 10 minutes for you to have a cup of tea, a beer, a comfort break or whatever. Uh, it's 25 past, so don't go away. We've got some great questions to ask you, Bob. And okay. we'll start doing that in 10 minutes at 25 to nine or whatever time it is in your time zone. <laughs> 25 to four, <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> Okay, so don't go away, folks. We'll be yep. back in 10 minutes. Cheers.
Oh, Cheers, I, Steve. I've got my drink. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> I had to drink since it's an English invented beer. I'm drinking um, a beer brewed in Hershey called Tr Trogues Lucky Holler Hazy IPA. <laughs> so it's an English style beer. Oh, okay. Well, IPA <laughs> is Indian pale ale, isn't it? I'm not, I, I don't know if it came from India or whether that's just the actual name that that type of beer is given. It's like a pale ale, isn't it? Yeah, and it was invented by British sailors uh, who would do these long, you know, hauls between, you know, England and uh, India. Uh -huh. It has these, you know, chemicals in it that help preserve it for these long hauls. So that's why they call it India Pale Ale. Okay. I was just it. thinking there, Bob, when you said uh, Hershey, obviously Hershey's chocolate bars, Everton, you've, you've really got the wrong shirt on, mate. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know at least one person... Chris Banks will not be happy seeing that shit. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You've got, still got time to get changed, you know. No. I, I am listening, guys. I am here. There you go, Chris. <laughs> I, I should mention that even He's though... He's wearing the shit, Chris. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I should mention that even though Hershey is famous for its chocolate, yeah. by far the biggest employer in the town now is Pennsylvania State University has its medical school there. It's only about a mile from where I live. They did the first ever artificial heart transplant there like 20, 30 years ago. Mm. And that's where my dad, he was, he founded the chair of pathology there. He actually worked in the 1970s. You might've heard of Dr. Anthony Fauci. Mm -hmm. He was a visiting professor there in the seventies and worked with my father. So the main employer in town now is this giant, and it's humongous, you know, a giant medical complex. It's, you know, mm -hmm. very high level. Um, I mean, it has one of the best children's hospitals in the whole world. So it, it actually employs now far more people than the chocolate company. <laughs> I, I was just thinking when, when you said Hershey and obviously pale ale, uh, there is a, a dark beer that you can buy in the UK. I think it's actually imported, but uh, it's actually chocolate flavor. Yep. And yeah, you, I think, actually, you, you tasted it, yeah? Yeah, and there, there's a, <laughs> there's several um, beers you can get in my local area. This company that I'm drinking called Trogues, which is in Hershey, they make yeah. several stouts that have a chocolatey flavor. Um, and the Hershey Chocolate Company has collaborated with another brewer called Yingling on a chocolate stout. But the first ever chocolatey beer I had was British, uh, Mackeson. Which oh, you, yes. can't, Mackey's. <laughs> you can't get it in the U.S. anymore. And that really irritates me because I, I like, you know, I really I liked it when it was available in the U.S. Is it still available in England? Well, to be honest, it, it, that to me is a drink from the 70s. I, I, I don't know if you still get it. Pale Ale, Mackey's. Okay, how much? I'm not sure if it's still yeah. blue. Uh, no, but my dad used to bring, my dad used to go to the, the local pub club and he'd bring back a bottle of Mackey's for me mum. And, then, oh, and loads of bags of uh, crisp or potato chips uh, okay. for, for the kids, you know. But yeah, but the Mackies haven't had that for a long time. Yeah, it's, I haven't had it probably since the 90s. Stout, yeah. yeah. Well, well, Bob, this is Carter. Yeah, hey, hey uh, Carter. Hi, Carter. Hi, I can't, I, I can't support Yingling. They were supporters of Mr. Trump, so I just have to. Oh, yeah, well, oh, my God. No, 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 I don't. Have to, I just have to keep away. I'd like from to say them. the majority uh, of people of the UK are not supporting Mr. Trump. No. <laughs> what a crazy and, and Carter man. and I and, yeah. and our my friend Anne, we might find out later today <laughs> whether the United States will remain a democracy or not. The Supreme Court, if it decides to uphold this lawsuit, could basically say that millions of people's votes don't count. And that would include my state of Pennsylvania. Yeah. The thing is, I'm not very worried about it. The lawsuit is so ridiculous. <laughs> it's laughable. It's totally laughable. So I, I'm, I'm like 99.9% .9 confident the Supreme Court is going to throw it out. And in fact, they're probably deliberating at this very moment. Yeah. And what they're probably talking about is like this lawsuit is so ridiculous. How do we deal? Like, we're going to kill it. We're, we're going to say no. But what do we do with it? Like, how do we tell these people who 
want to overthrow the election and keep Trump president, how do we get them to like, no, you're not going to do that? So, we say no many times. Eventually, they'll get the idea. It'll take time. You, you the thing hope. is not to worry about it too much, Bob and, and, and Carter, because we've only loaned it back to you. You actually got the USA on lease. We, you know, we've only leased it back to you for a thousand years or so. Oh, real? well, okay. Well, yeah, you can you know, take and it we, we, we can actually you know, just have it back whenever. If you get tired of it, we'll just carry on. We'll sort it out for you. Don't worry. Yeah, let Canada it's just okay. come in and take over. Canada... Is yeah, a much yeah. more civilized country. In fact, right now, if I could, I would get in my car. I have some very dear friends who live in Toronto, mm -hmm. and they would, you know, I'm worried we might have violence in this country in the coming coming weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because you know we've got millions of Trump supporters who own guns, and they're very heavily on the. It's not just little pistols; they own very, very powerful military grade weapons. And they train, you know, as units. A lot of them are ex-military. There's a real possibility we're going to have some serious violence in the weeks ahead. Mm. If I could, if I literally could, I would go to Canada right now. I would actually go to the UK, except you have the Brexit stuff coming up. Uh, well. <laughs> I, I would go to Canada or if better yet, farther away, Australia or New Zealand. Well, again, we've only loaned Australia back to them for a short period of time. Okay, well. yeah. <laughs> right, I'm, I'm going to call time. Time. For okay, Steve. Politics. Stay yeah. away from politics. In that was the interval. Back to astronomy. So uh, we do have, if anybody, um, we've never done this before, but if anybody wants to uh, put their cameras on and put their microphones on and so we can all see each other, then then that's fine. And if it works okay, then we'll, we'll stay like that for the, the question and answer. But... Uh, if you don't want to, then that's that's fine. You don't you don't have to. So we've we've got some good questions, uh, Bob. So okay. I hope you've got your thinking cap with you. Okay. If I can't answer them, I'll tell you. I'll say such, and then try to find the answer and email you later. Uh, let me just shut my door so I'm not uh, okay. shouting. We can always take it to uh, the question to the floor if that's the case, Bob. Yeah. Uh, in a, and obviously in an orderly fashion. Yeah. And get the thoughts of uh, our uh, guests, you know, our, our, our uh, members. Okay, so uh, I've got a question from David Roper, and his question is: Now, you, you, we went to the uh, the gas giants and their moons, but uh, Bob, Bob, um, if you had to decide on a priority, where to go and look for life in our solar system, would it be the moons of Saturn? Uh, that's a great question. Um, and by the way, when, when I've done given this talk to American clubs, I get great questions. So this is a topic that really gets people thinking and asking great questions. Um, you know, that, that's a question that's really debated among astrobiologists is where's the best place to look? I think Mars is kind of, you know, the first place to look just because you know, the missions there are the easiest to pull off technologically. And, you know, because we have some real evidence that there could have been life there on Mars. And I, I think the methane and oxygen is, is really tantalizing because, you know, those are both uh, biogenic gases on Earth that are almost entirely produced by biology. So for me, Mars is the most obvious initial target but, uh, you know, especially Saturn, I showed both moons. I only talked about Enceladus very briefly, but Enceladus has um, a water as well. We know that there's jets. The NASA ESA Cassini mission, um, you know, took these incredible images of jets shooting out from the South Polar region of, of Enceladus. And that, 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 though, you know, they're water rich. There's evidence that there's organics in those plumes. And we believe that that ocean is not very far below the icy surface. And because there's jets there, it's going to be relatively accessible. Like the ice shell on Europa might be many, many miles thick, meaning the ocean is really hard to probe directly. So I would list Enceladus as a very, very, and it's not just me, this is the scientific community, 
lists Enceladus as a very, very high priority. But I want to also mention Titan is that Titan's a really intriguing world because it had, you know, just like Earth, we have the water cycle where water rains out of the atmosphere, forms oceans and rivers and lakes on the surface, and then the water evaporates and forms clouds and then rains down. We have the same cycle going on on Titan, except it's methane instead of water. And, you know, methane is organic. So there's actually some evidence. There could be liquid water beneath uh, Titan's surface that's mixed with ammonia to give it a freezing point, a lower freezing point. So there could be, you know, there could definitely be life on Titan as well. So I, I view Titan and Enceladus, and it's not just me. I mean, I'm just repeating what the scientific community is saying, but I view both of those worlds as very, very high priority. It's just that right now there aren't any approved missions to Enceladus from like NASA or ESA, but I would love to see a, a dedicated life-finding mission sent to Enceladus. Thanks, Bob. That's, that's a great answer. That's just what I was looking for. Thank you. I just wish we could do the two together. That's right. Yeah, that's great. And, and you know, absolutely Titan. I, I'm just so excited by this rotorcraft mission. There's actually going to, I just want to mention real briefly that there is going to be on the NASA Perseverance rover is going to fly a small helicopter called Ingenuity. And that's a really, really cool mission too. I think it's more of a technology demonstration mission. Um, so, but the, the, the Dragonfly rotorcraft mission to Titan, that is a very serious scientific mission. One really great thing about Titan's atmosphere is the pressure at the surface is about one and a half times the pressure you get at Liverpool at sea level. And the, in the atmosphere, it doesn't have like sulfuric acid. It's relatively benign, very, very cold, but you can engineer for that. So it's actually, there's low, of course, Titan's a moon. It has low gravity and a very thick atmosphere, which exerts a lot of pressure. So flying a helicopter on Titan is actually not that hard thing. You know, the, the, pro the problem is getting there and keeping it powered. But once that thing starts flying around Titan, Titan's a relatively easy world to fly in with a rotorcraft. So I, I just find it like that was took a lot of, of gumption on NASA's part to approve that mission. I mean, that is like a far out cutting edge mission to fly a helicopter on Titan. And I hope it works. Yeah, me too. Thanks very much, Bob. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for the question. Uh, I've got a question from Chris Banks. Hi, Bob. How important to SETI was the Arecibo radio telescope? Um, that, that another great question. I can tell I'm going to get great questions. So Arecibo has done SETI for, for decades. A lot of it was piggybacking on more normal, routine astronomical observations. But it had a mirror, 305 or, or reflective dish, 305 meters across and that made it very very sensitive to you know faint signals so i would say that for seti it's a big loss but to my knowledge it wasn't really being used that much for seti in recent years um so basically these arrays like the allen telescope array in, in uh california the Murchison Array in uh, Australia, and then you've got Parks and the Green Bank Telescope. I, I think even with the loss of Arecibo, they were going to be the major radio telescopes used for SETI in the coming decade. So I would say, yes, it is a loss, but not so much that radio SETI will stop. It's going to continue. And even, you know, with these other telescopes would have continued with SETI observations, with or without Arecibo. Having said that, I mean, it, that was such a workhorse for amateur astronomy ever since, the, or for astron radio astronomy ever since the 60s. So its loss will be felt. 
yeah yeah thank you thank you okay thank you for the question uh, let me just remind everybody that we are still recording this uh, and i believe it's still going out on youtube as well okay um okay moving on uh, i've got a question from mark galvin uh, the dried out riverbeds on mars could they be younger than generally assumed doesn't the constant scouring from dust storms erode them relatively quickly? Uh, that, that's another great question. And this is something I, I want to make it clear. I'm not an expert on this. Um, but when astronomers look at, um, when they really study the evolution of how Mars evolved over time, because it's a small planet with, a, with fairly, its gravity at the surface, is only about a third or maybe about 33 to 40 percent that on earth and because it didn't have a global magnetic field or it doesn't today the thinking is is that mars lost its atmosphere pretty early in the history that er very early in mars's history it would have had a very thick at atmosphere you know coming from those giant volcanoes pumping lots of co2 in the atmosphere, you know, CO2 and other greenhouse gases. And that enabled Mars to have like a clement, you know, good temperatures at the surface at the time when the sun was fainter than it is today. Um, and that over time, Mars lost its atmosphere, uh, that it was eroded away by the solar wind and also giant impacts would have literally blasted away a lot of gas in Mars's atmosphere. So the thinking is, is that those channels formed very early in Mars's history within the first billion or so years. And that's when you could have had, you know, weather and clouds and rain and, and rivers and lakes on the surface of Mars. But that Mars probably by 3 billion years ago had lost most of its atmosphere, and that would have caused the uh, these channels to dry up. So I, I th I'm sure there has been erosion, but without the water to erode, the erosion is much slower rate than on Earth. And of course, Mars doesn't have plate tectonics, which is also a major force for erosion on Earth. So I think it's pretty clear that those channels do in fact date back to very early in Mars's history. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you for the question. Uh, I've got a question from John Kane. Do, do you, I, I'm trying to think what television program this reminds me of. <laughs> but University Challenge, I think, with the, the questions. I don't know if you have that, that program in the US. Um, okay, so I've got a question from John Kane. Do you think the Drake equation is credible when trying to determine the number of technologically advanced civilizations? Uh, okay, I, I'm going to assume that's a, another great question. I'm going to assume that people know what the Drake equation is. It's a way of you know taking the different factors that would enable intelligent life to develop, like you know the number of stars in the galaxy, the fraction that have planets the fraction where life develops, the fraction, you know, that develop intelligent life, and then the lifetime of those civilizations. Uh, that's the Drake equation. In fact, recently I was in the room in West Virginia at Green Bank where Frank Drake and Carl Sagan devised that equation. And that was a real thrill for me to be in that room. Um, I think it's a great equation. It was a brilliant idea. And I, I, I mean, I think it's still very much relevant. The problem is it has terms, especially the last one, the average lifetime of a communicating civilization that we don't know what those numbers, oh great, oh yeah, definitely post it. Um, we don't know what those terms actually are. Now here's the good news, okay? Look at the terms on the left, R star, FP, N, E, those are now being filled in by astronomical observations. I don't know what the exact numbers are, but we now have very, very good educated guesses. Like 
F sub P, fraction of stars with planetary systems, that is, if it's not one, it's a very high fraction. It's well over 0 0.5. We can now say that like a very large percentage of stars have planets. So at what my, the basic point is these numbers on the left are getting filled in by astronomical observations. It's the numbers on the right that remain unknown. We don't know like how many, you know, we do, as I was saying earlier, we don't know what fraction of planets where life actually develops. We don't know, that's F sub E. We don't know the fraction where intelligent life emerges. We don't know F sub C, the ones that actually develop detectable, so, detectable signs. And we don't, we especially don't know L, the average lifetime. So different scientists plug in different numbers and you get different values for n. You, you always have to get n equals one because we're here right now, but you can get numbers anywhere from one. I think even like the most optimistic astronomers now say that n is probably at most of maybe a few tens of thousands. Uh, back like in Carl Sagan's day, they thought millions. I don't think anybody thinks that today. So I think right now the numbers can range anywhere from one to several ten, tens of thousands. There is an astronomer who I know personally who is based in England, but although he's American originally named Chris Consolis, and he came out with a paper just a few months ago where he came up with N equals 300. And I wrote back to him and, you know, I know him. I knew him back from the days when he was a graduate student in the U.S. And I used to edit some articles he wrote. And I, I don't think it's something we can really calculate, though. I think it's an ob I think the Drake equation is very helpful. But ultimately, this is an observational question. We can only answer the question by observing and looking, you know, doing SETI and looking for signs of techno signatures. Uh, but I do think it, it's a brilliant idea and we are making progress in filling in some of these terms. Okay, thank you, thank you. Can I just ask you, uh, Bob, to probably, you probably need to um, stop your screen sharing now. So people okay. can the, uh, the full gallery screen. Oh, let's see, let me, uh... if you don't mind, thank you. And we've got plenty more questions. How how are you for time? Uh, I've got plenty of time. Yep. Yeah. Let's see. I, I'm not sure how to. Uh, Bob, I think it's okay. When I started sharing that one with the Drake equation, I think yeah. it took yours off. So. Okay, okay, that's okay, and and that's good because that that was a I, I was actually I have a slide for the Drake equation uh, that I was going to try to pull up, but you pulled it up before I could do that. I've actually given this talk to some American clubs. And I actually, on one or two of them, I'd actually discuss the Drake equation. So, but that, I mean, it's a great idea. Um, you know, Frank Drake, and he's still alive. He's in the late, I think he's in his late 80s now. But I mean, he absolutely pioneered the entire field of SETI. Uh, you know, he did the first SETI experiment in 1960 at Green Bank. And, it, you know, really thought deeply about it. My only criticism though of him and other radio astronomers is that they, I think they got too wedded to the idea of radio SETI. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to go into this, but, you know, starting at like later on, like Charles Towns, who helped invent the laser, who's a Nobel Prize winner, he came up with the idea of the optical SETI looking for lasers. And the, uh, initially, the and, you know, it's a really good idea. And, and you know, his, it, like, let's not put all our eggs in one basket. But the Radio SETI people, they were very close-minded like 20, 30 years ago to any other way of looking for ET other than radio. But I can definitely tell you, and this is good, that is not true today. The, 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 the people doing SETI today are very broad-minded in their thinking. And they, they are, there's even been entire scientific conferences where they gather people together to think of techno-signatures. 
So it, it's gotten much more broad in its thinking. And when we're thinking about extraterrestrial intelligence, you got to think very broadly because we don't know what these civilizations are going to be doing. So I think the more ideas, the better. I would say the Keith Cooper book that I recommended, he goes into a lot of that. That, that was a really, really good book. I, I can't recommend that book. I've never met him in person. I hope someday I get to meet him. But that I can't recommend that book highly enough. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, next question is from uh, Zoltan Gregus. And his question is, how can we be certain that if one day we discover, we, sorry, we discover microbial life on Mars, it is genuinely Martian and not a contamination from Earth, transported there with the very same low rover? How can we eliminate such a false positive result? Okay, wow, uh, this is great, great, another great question. Um, that he, he identifies a very serious problem in that you don't want to send a spacecraft to Mars that discovers life and it discovers life that was brought to it by the spacecraft. I mean, I'll tell you right now, there's life on Mars mm -hmm. right now, 100%. It's on these Mars rovers that NASA has sent to Mars because they do take precautions to sterilize them, like they heat them and, you know, they, they take various, you know, bathe them in ultraviolet light, but they are not 100% sterile when they get to Mars. There are undoubtedly microbes hit, hitching a ride. I'm going to give you an example here, Apollo 12 landed on Mars, you know, a few months after Apollo 11, and it landed within a few hundred meters of a surveyor lander, a robotic lander that NASA had landed a year or two earlier. Well, the astronauts went and collected parts on the surveyor lander and brought them back to Earth. And there was life on the surveyor lander. There were certain types of bacteria that are resistance to space radiation and it can exist in incredibly harsh conditions. So there is life on Mars right now that we have brought to Mars from Earth. So that is a very, very relevant question. And I would go back to what I talked about with the Rosalind Franklin ESA rover, that it, you could find certain signatures that like if it uses different amino acids or it uses a molecule different than, than DNA, you can say, okay, that did not come from Earth because we haven't found any life on Earth, anywhere on Earth that doesn't use those 20 amino acids or that's, that uses right-handed amino acids or that uses a molecule to transmit and encode genetic information other than DNA. So if you found that on Mars, you have definitely shown that you found indigenous Mars life. But I would agree with the premise of the question that you're starting to find life that looks suspiciously like Earth life. And if we've really contaminated the planet, then it's like, uh oh, we needed to find life on Mars before and really prove it before we contaminated the planet. And there are you know, scientists who thought very deeply about this that say we should not send people to Mars until we've answered this question once and for all. Because once you send people, if you want to contaminate Mars with terrestrial life, it's not just people that are going to Mars. We're going to bring our, our bacteria and viruses with us to Mars. So you could argue that we should not send people to Mars until we've answered that question. Okay. And people have made that argument. Brilliant, okay, thank you very much. Are you okay to answer a few more questions? Yeah, sure, yeah, no, these are great, this is fun. No, I love it, like very thoughtful questions from, you know, I can tell people who are really interested and informed by this topic. Okay, so I, I have a question from Phil Williams. Um, how different is the descent and landing system to be used 
for Rosalind Franklin from that used in the first part of the ExoMars mission. When the Schiaparelli lander crash landed on Mars in October 2016. Okay, that was that was that be the Beagle lander that yeah. we're talking about. I'm not sure. Was it? Uh, there was, Phil, was that Beagle, Phil? Yeah, there was an earlier. Uh, uh, no, it was. It wasn't Beagle. Uh, I mean, the ExoMars mission consists of two parts. The first part uh, blasted off in 2016, and. The idea of the first part was to land Schiaparelli as a, a as a test onto the Martian surface, and in addition to putting the trace the trace uh -huh. gas orbiter into orbit. Now, my understanding was that when Schiaparelli crash landed, they actually thought about the future of the entire mission. Wow. Uh, I understand that Schiaparelli crashed because the parachute uh, started the uh, lander spinning and the detection equipment thought it was uh, lower than it was and the retro rockets didn't fire on time and it, and it smashed into the Martian surface. It, it was detected by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, so, oh, yeah, I remember that now. Yeah, so I was just wondering, I mean, at the time, I thought the entire mission was potentially going to be cancelled or at least significantly delayed. So I thought that they were looking again at the mechanism of how they were going to drop this lander, uh, which in this case will be the, it's now been called Rosalind Franklin or it will contain Rosalind Franklin and, and what they're doing now uh, and whether or not that system's being changed. But I'm not certain what the position is. Yeah, no, that's a great question, Phil. And I, I have, to, I want to be honest here. That's sort of beyond my technical level of knowledge about the ESA, about you know the ESA Rosalind Franklin mission. What I can say, and I'm not going to be able to really answer your question, is this was maybe about ten years ago. ESA tried to land a very low cost lander. I don't think it was a rover, but just a small lander called Beagle 2 after Darwin's famous ship. Now, I, I remember that's when I still worked at Sky and Telescope, and I talked to several you know, American planetary scientists, and I, I don't want to make it come across here like I'm being anti-British, okay? That's not what I'm saying. I, they, they told me that has no chance of, of, of working. And the reason wasn't because it was being built by the British. It was an incredibly low cost mission. It was, I mean, it was a brilliant idea to try to do landing on Mars on the cheap, to do it on a very low, small rover or small lander and do it on a, at a very low cost mission. So I was hearing prior to the mission getting to Mars that they felt, the, at least the people, who, Americans who are aware of it, thought it had a very low probability of success. Having said that, it, I think it was only like a few tens of millions of dollars. So it, it's not like there was a lot of resources and money put into it. The idea at the time was you just can't land on Mars without putting a lot more money and resources and investigation into it. Yeah, so I yeah. don't know enough technologically about this la the the lander that Phil is return, you know, referring to. Having said that, I have no doubt. I mean, there's all this this stuff about the ghoul of Mars and how, you know, the the most missions sent to Mars are unsuccessful, and I don't mean to demean the Soviet Union. That mainly applies to their when you say that Mars missions have been unsuccessful, it's you're mainly referring to the Soviet missions and the very early NASA missions, like in the 60s, when we're really learning how to do planetary exploration. If you look at NASA in recent years, its record of success with its Mars exploration program is phenomenally successful. And all of their, except for that one that crashed because they substituted English for metric units, that was called Mars Polar Lander, that crashed. But if you go back to, you know, uh, Sojourner and Pathfinder in 1997, 
all but one of the NASA landers have, has been successful. And I have no doubt that, you know, ESA has tapped that knowledge and, you know, you know, ESA has gotten better and better. The vast majority of ESA missions are overwhelmingly successful. And imagine, look at the Huygens lander that landed on Titan in 2006. Not only did it take great pictures and data as it was parachuting through Titan's atmosphere, it landed successfully and transmitted data for about an hour and a half when they were, the, the goal of the mission was to get three minutes of data from the surface. Well, they got an hour and a half's worth of data in the surface. The spacecraft was still working, but her, Cassini, which was relaying the data, went over the horizon. So it lasted and sent data back as long as it possibly could. So I, you know, I, I actually have high level of confidence in Rosalind Franklin and the fact that they were having problems with a parachute and didn't rush it and said, look, we're willing to postpone the mission two years. So the next launch window, I, I you know, I'm not going to, I wouldn't bet my life on it, but I, I have a very high confidence given the track record of ESA in recent years with its great, great missions I, I, my guess is it'll work really, really well. And as I said, NASA's had great success and I'm sure there's a lot of discussions back and forth and that ESA can learn a lot from NASA and vice versa. Um, so I, I'm very confident Rosalind Franklin will work. Not 100% confidence, but probably 90, 95% confidence it'll work. Thanks, Bob. Cheers. Thank you. Okay. I hope you don't feel I was being insulted to British engineers. I that was not my intention. <laughs> not at all. No. Yeah. Uh, okay, we've got three or four questions left, so I'll, I'll uh, we'll move on. Uh, another question from Mark: uh, How small and accurate does a, a coronagraph have to be to be able to block out the disk of a star? Okay. Um, that that's another wow great great questions um that that is, it's interesting because it really depends on the kind of mission so for example when, when you think of a space mission that uses a coronagraph one plan is to you could launch a space telescope and launch a star shade that would, let's say, orbit the sun in a different orbit than the telescope and might be millions of miles away, but you would line them up in such a way that the, the star shade would block out the light of the star. That's one way to do the mission. The problem with that type of mission is you're limiting the number of stars you could survey. There's another way of doing this called null interferometry, where you launch multiple smaller telescopes and configure them in such a way that they work together as one telescope to null out by lining up like the crest with, of the starlight with the troughs of the starlight and another telescope that you cancel out the light of the star. So there's a number of different, and you can do that like with either in space or on the ground. So there's a number of different ways you can do this, where you can basically try to block out the light of the star. I'm not an expert on this, so I don't wanna say much more than this, but it really depends whether you're doing this in space or on the ground and what kind of telescope you are using the coronagraph technology with. Yeah. But it, I was it, kind it, of picturing I, it as being some kind of tiny, tiny disc. Yeah, it, it's you know, actually held. <laughs> it's actually more. And I wish it was that simple. It's actually <laughs> much more complicated. I'd imagine than that, that you would start getting interference effects. You know, that's with, right. Yeah, and the problem, you know, there's so small. Yeah, that's right. There's all sorts of things with light where you're manipulating light at a very, very high level, you know, a very finite level. And that makes coronagraphy very, very challenging technologically. But, but to really get the great data, 
on planets that are not transiting their stars. And remember, that's like 95% of planets do not transit their stars as seen from Earth. And though, you know, probably most of the biologically interesting ones, like the one around Proxima Centauri, that star, that planet does not transit. So you need to come up with ways to blot out the light of the star so you can see the light of the planet and really study the planet in detail with, with, it, with the light of the planet not being contaminated by the starlight. And that is a very uh, difficult challenge. I think that's an important point you brought up there because a lot of people assume that the way, you know, there's a, there's a plane to the solar system and most things orbit in that plane. That's not a, a rule across the universe. Things right. are orbiting at all kinds of different angles. And, you know, it's not like everything is all spinning nicely on one plane across the entire universe. That's right. That's a, that's a great point. Um, and here's an, you, you, you raised a point that I just want to make another point. And that is, I'm sure all of you have heard of the uh, zodiacal dust in the solar system. Okay, well, other planetary systems also have zodiacal dust. And if you're looking at a planetary system from, let's say, several dozen light years away, you're looking at the planet through its system's zodiacal dust. And that makes the planet even harder to study. So I can't emphasize enough these kinds of studies that astronomers are contemplating with these future telescopes, both in space and on the ground. I mean, we're talking very, very serious technological challenges. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have another question for you. We're hammering you with questions here this evening, Bob. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> with all the SpaceX satellites being launched, how will this affect the accuracy of the new telescopes coming online in the next decade? Is there going to be a limit on how many they will be able to launch? Okay, I, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question, Steve? Yeah, sure. With all the SpaceX satellites being launched, how will this affect the accuracy of the new telescopes coming online in the next decade? Is there going to be a limit on how many they will be able to launch? Okay, uh, you know, I don't know much about that SpaceX. I, I, I haven't really followed that. I will say though that there's, you know, I think all of you are aware of the growing problem of space junk, and that's a real problem. There's also the problem of, you know, building lots of satellites that reflect light back to Earth and how that'll interfere with the observations of ground-based telescopes. And I know that, for example, the International Astronomical Union, there's real concern about that. And I know in the United States with American Astronomical Society, that is a real concern that there's gonna be so much noise from our own satellites that you know, that could definitely become a problem for Earth-based observations. And then when you think of space telescopes, the more space junk we have, you know, the more probability of collisions. Well, you know, for example, the Hubble Space Telescope's been operating since 1990, and people wonder, well, how much longer is it gonna last? Well, the end of the mission might come from some piece of space junk, you know, hitting the mirror or some critical component of Hubble and therefore rendering it inoperable. One of the things you can do with, for example, JWST is JWST is not going to be in low Earth orbit. It's going to be launched to the second Lagrangian point. So it's gravitational balance between the Earth, Sun, and Moon. It might be in the future that low Earth orbit becomes a no-go zone for space telescopes because it'll simply be too dangerous an environment with all the different satellites and space junk orbiting low Earth orbit. Okay, thank you for that. Moving on, we've got another good question for you, Bob. Okay, uh-oh. 
<laughs> the Fermi paradox asked why, with all the potentially habitable planets in the universe, we haven't yet found any sign of intelligent life anywhere, apart from on the Earth. That's questionable. That's questionable, yeah. <laughs> Not in the US if we elected Trump president. <laughs> so the, the question is, what are your thoughts on this? Okay, that, that's a great question. And I would definitely recommend one of the four books I recommended, Stephen Webb goes through lots and lots and lots of different possible explanations from the Fermi paradox and give, he, he also has a TED talk. If you just Google his name, he has a very, very good TED talk about that, that I think it's about like half an hour that I highly recommend. Um, that is an un, it's, it is the Fermi paradox is basically like if there were lots of civilizations out there, why don't we see evidence for them? Like they should be all over the galaxy. You know, it should be obvious that they're here. And that is a very reasonable question. And it, it is an unknown answer. You know, I think the two mate, the, the, the most answers fall into two major categories. One is that intelligent life is very, very uncommon that, you know, maybe you need there's And that's what Stephen Webb concludes is, for example, maybe the step from going from multicellular life to complex plant and animal life is very, very rare. Almost even if you have billions of planets with life, only a tiny fraction of them go through that transition. Or the step from complex life to intelligent life. And once again on earth, that took a very, very long time on earth, billions of years. So that's one possibility is that intelligent life is very uncommon. Maybe N in the Drake equation is one. I absolutely think that is possible. The other idea is that there are other civilizations out there. Maybe they don't get to the level where they go out and colonize the galaxy or maybe they destroy themselves or maybe they're aware that we're here and they realize we're kind of in this transitional phase. We're not ready to be contacted yet. So they're kind of hiding. That's sort of like the prime directive in Star Trek so that they're like making sure that we don't become aware of their existence. So I think those are kind of two of the you know broad categories of explanations for the Fermi paradox. Um, hard to say which one I think is more likely. I would just say once again, we don't know. So we just need to go out and observe and explore. That's what I like the idea about the techno signature idea is you could have civilizations out there that even if they're not trying to signal their existence, we might still be able to find the exist evidence of their existence, whether they would want us to or not. That's why I like that idea of techno signatures. But which of those two broad categories is more likely? That is an absolutely fascinating question. I would love to know the answer to that question, but I would just say we don't know right now. Okay, thank you. So a couple of comments came up when we were um, um, talking about, uh, are we all living in a computer simulation? And one person asked me, if we're living in a computer simulation, then can we reboot it, please? <laughs> <laughs> I love that, yeah. And one, one thing I'm gonna do is when we're done with this talk, there was a great article a few months ago in Scientific American Magazine. They have a daily newsletter that's actually very good. And they had an article about research done by one of your compatriots who's now at Columbia University in New York City named David Kipping. A few years ago, I edited an article he wrote about uh, for Sky and Telescope about how astronomers can find moons orbiting planets around other stars. In fact, he recently came, if I recall, it was he came out with a paper. They actually probably have, probably have found several exomoons, but they haven't confirmed it yet. It'll take more data and analysis to confirm it. Well, he, he came up with this paper that was published earlier this year 
in which he concluded it's 50-50 that we're living in a simulation. So I don't have the paper, but I have the Scientific American article based on that paper. And it was really interesting. So when we're done with this Zoom thing, I will find that I saved it on my computer and I'll send that to Steve. So I don't want all of you to think that either I'm totally crazy or that David Kipping is totally crazy. That's it. Wow, you guys are fast. Yep, that's it. That's the article right there. Yeah, it came out just about two months ago. Okay, thank you. That is that. it. That is the article. And you'll notice that they mentioned Dave Kipping in the article. Okay, so. And I, I, you know, once again, I don't, I'm not, I don't believe it. Okay. I, <laughs> I don't believe we're living in a simulation. I mean, I don't, I'm not saying it's zero possibility. I just think there's too many, you know, the world, this world is so complex that um, it's hard for me to imagine we're in a civilization, but who knows? I mean, I certainly feel like I'm a conscious, living, conscious being who is not the product of like a computer simulation, but I don't really know that for a fact. I think we're all being influenced by Star Trek over the years. Yeah, so that's right. Another question the Matrix. Asks, yeah. are, we, are we living on a holodeck? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the one thing I want, to, want us to invent, we've invented laptops and communicators and iPads. The one thing I'd like us to invent is a transporter, please, so that we can get around a lot easier. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. I, I should just mention that when I was at Astronomy Magazine, I got to do a couple articles where I interviewed Patrick Stewart and some of the stars of the next generation. Really, yeah. And then I later interviewed Tim Russ of the Voyager series. Mm -hmm. um, they were really interesting to interview. These are all actors. Mm -hmm. It was interesting talking to Patrick Stewart, who of course is British. Mm -hmm. I, I actually interviewed him twice, uh, a couple of years apart. He, he, you could tell he really didn't know much about astronomy, no, but no. you could also tell he's a very deeply thoughtful man who was really inspired to think about these types of issues mm -hmm. by playing Captain Picard in Star Trek. And he was also very gracious and really a pleasure to interview on the telephone. I didn't meet him in person, but I came away from those two interviews and I probably upstairs in one of my rooms, I have the, ta the, the tape of those interviews and I should someday digitize them. Um, I, you know, he was a very thoughtful man. Uh, when I interviewed Tim Russ, who played Tuvok the Vulcan in Star Trek, I believe it was that, which series was that? Deep Space well, Nine? Yeah. Yeah. He, he actually is an amateur astronomer. Was he really? Yeah. yeah. And he is, he was incredibly knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he, you know, and he said that he had a friend of his who worked at J he lives in Pasadena, California. And he goes, Oh, I have a friend who works at JPL who I talk to every week who updates what's going on at NASA. So he actually like was unbelievably knowledgeable about astronomy and physics. It was great talking to him. Book him for a lecture now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I actually really like talking to Tim. I mean, he was really interesting to talk to. Well, he's a Vulcan. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Maybe that's why they picked him. I mean, yeah. he, he, you know, he knew a lot. I mean, trust me. He, I mean, he owned a telescope. I don't remember what kind he had, but I mean, he he is a serious amateur astronomer. Good. Good. Okay. Moving on, I've got a question from Zoltan Gregus again. Okay. And uh, the question is, let me uh, take a deep breath to read this one. I believe I have heard the following argument from Neil deGrasse Tyson. A sufficiently advanced civilization does not necessarily venture out to colonize interstellar space as it is advanced enough to provide plenty of resources and habitats to itself in its own solar system, therefore not in need to turn interstellar, except in extreme situations, like if their local star is about to go supernova. Thus concluding, there are no interstellar civilizations out there. Answering the question, where is everyone? I wonder what your take is. Okay, uh, uh, that, and I've gotten the chance to meet Neil deGrasse Tyson on a couple occasions. 
And I have a bumper sticker on my car where he says the good thing about science uh, is that it's true whether or not you believe it. <laughs> so I actually have his bumper sticker on my car. And he's, I should also mention, I've met him twice now. He is also, if you, any of you ever get a chance to meet him in person, he is a really nice guy. I mean, he, years ago, he gave me a tour of, of the planet, you know, the planetarium and the natural history museum. He's a really nice guy, a real gentleman. So I, I have a very high regard for him. Although I'll just add, I know a few things about him that he doesn't want made public that I'm not going to say tonight. Sorry. Um, he, you know, we don't know uh, that once again, this gets into understanding the motivations of civilizations for, you know, where the creatures are the product of a different planet and evolutionary environment. And then to extrapolate what they would do, you know, thousands or millions of years into the future, we just don't know. Um, so he could be right that a lot of civilizations just kind of retreat inward and just kind of live on their home planet. My guess is, you know, if there are a lot of civilizations, we're going to see a range of activities. We're going to see some that'll be more aggressive and go out and explore and colonize and others that might retreat inward. We just, I would just say that's another question where we just don't know. And we can't really answer that question by just trying to extrapolate what humans like 500 years from now might do. And, you know, just as a case in point, a few months ago, I gave this talk to the amateur telescope makers of Boston, right at about the 400th anniversary of the pilgrims landing at Plymouth Rock in Massachusetts. Um, now, if you were to go back 400 years, and let's say I tried to show these people, either in England or the pilgrims, my iPhone, they would have burned me at the stake. I mean, they would have seen like I'm witchcraft or crazy. Like it, it would have been so outside their conceptual horizon of their era. So when we're thinking about civilizations of beings or maybe artificial intelligence from a different planet with a different environment that is, you know, that's gone on for millions of years, I would just say we have no idea what their behavior would be. We just don't know. We do know, though, that eventually stars evolve. And even if their star doesn't go supernova, there's going to be a point a few hundred million years from now on Earth where the sun is going to get so hot that it'll evaporate the oceans and turn Earth into a Venus with a surface temperature of you know, 500 degrees Celsius. So there's going to be a time when civilizations are either going to have to move on or probably perish. So civilizations, assuming they follow our trajectory, they're going to come to understand stellar evolution, and they're going to come to a point where they realize they need to move on from their home planet. So that's the one thing I can say that that would push civilizations to at least at some point become a spacefaring society. But ultimately we don't know. And I would, I would take exception with anybody who thinks they know exactly what civilizations millions of years ahead of us will or will not do. Okay, thank you. Now we're coming to the very final question, Bob. Okay. And uh, it's from Zoltan again. Okay. And, uh, he says, um, have you seen, oh, hang on, someone else has just put a question on, so okay. it's not the last one anymore. Okay, we'll, we'll make that one the last no, one. No, it's okay. That one, It wasn't a question. It was just a, a sort of thought oh, okay. to the okay. room. Okay. It's okay. okay. You can ask it if you want. I mean, I'll, I'll, Okay, yeah. So the, Zoltan's got a question about um, a Netflix program that I, I actually just started watching. In fact, it was, it was Anne that... Uh, told me about it and it's called alien worlds it's a, a four or five part series mini series so uh, as alton's asking have you have you watched it at all you know it's interesting because you Zoltan mentioned it i've several friends of mine now have emailed me about it um i watch very little television 
and I don't stream Netflix. I'm sort of a, I'm going to be honest about the only thing I watch on television is the English Premier League. <laughs> Believe it or not. That's about, I don't even watch American sports anymore for a variety of reasons. Too many TV commercials. I can watch a Premier League game for close to two hours and only have like five or 10 minutes of TV commercials. You watch American sports and you're watching TV commercials most of the time. So I don't really watch TV much. Now, I saw the trailer after a friend of mine emailed me about it. It looked really, really interesting. And correct me if I'm wrong, it's speculating about environments on other planets that might be different from Earth and then speculating what kind of life could exist under planets with very different environmental conditions in Earth. Is that correct? That's exactly what it's doing. Okay. I've only seen one, one uh, episode, but yeah. that was exactly what it was doing. It, it was talking about a, a planet that was much bigger and the atmosphere was heavier because uh, the gravity of the planet pulled the atmosphere further down. Uh, okay, yeah. So the atmosphere was a lot thicker. So uh, uh, flying things actually lived in the sky and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's uh, it's basically sci-fi with a little bit of what if. Yeah. And, uh, and a little bit of science as well. Yeah. I I you know to me there's there I have no objection to programs like that. I've I've seen programs of that type in the past, and you know if. If there are a lot of life, if life gets going relatively common, you know, like for example, if you ever, wherever worlds you have liquid water, energy, and organics, you ultimately get life. You know, and I mentioned this during the presentation, there are going to be worlds out there with environments totally different from what we have on Earth. And, you know, the light, you know, we can't really even imagine what kind of life forms might exist there. So I think it's really fun to kind of speculate in a program like this, what kind of alternate life forms might exist. And if you take the whole universe where there could be trillions and trillions of inhabited worlds out there, you know, probably some of these speculations come true and, you know, are probably something like that is out there somewhere, whether it's our galaxy or another galaxy, I would just say, and I, you know, I, and maybe I need to start getting Netflix so I can watch this TV program. I'm guessing too, that there are life forms out there that no human being could, even the most imaginative science fiction writer could even begin to dream of that exists out there, probably just in our galaxy alone. We, you know, that, that's why I'm so excited about this field and why sometimes I wish I was born a little bit later, maybe after great discoveries have been made. Uh, but my guess is there is so much out there. I mean, I guess I'm a believer in the idea that there are probably at least, this is a bare minimum of a billion worlds, planets and moons, in our galaxy that at least have primitive life, but my guess is it's much higher than a billion. Then you winnow that down to, you know, there's probably at least a few billion planets that have complex life. And then you get to like really like multicellular, and then you get to really complex like plant and animal life. You've winnowed that, winnowed that down further to maybe a few thousand to a few million, but you know, there could be so much out there life that is so different from anything we have on earth. Cause even on earth, look, I mean, just that slide I showed, we have an incredible variety of life on earth. And then you factor in different environments. Um, who knows what's out there. And I, I want to make this point too. There's this idea that earth is like the perfect planet for life that earth is like ideally suited for life. Well, there was an article in Scientific American uh, that ran about five years ago. And I'm the, the author's name was Renee, R-E-N-E -E Heller, H-E-L-L-E-R at the University of Montreal in Canada. 
And he made a very compelling argument in this article that Earth is a marginally inhabited planet. And you look, you know, we've got like dry deserts and deep ocean where there's not, a, there's life there, but not a lot of life. He pointed out that you could take a planet that's maybe about twice the mass of Earth called a super Earth. And it appears that super Earths are more abundant in the galaxy than planets the mass of Earth. So these are very abundant planets. And you put a super Earth in orbit around a K star. And there's like two or three times more K stars in the galaxy than there are G stars like the sun. That, and he made this argument in his article that, yep, that's it right there, that the super Earths orbiting K stars are more friendly, as it says in the title here, more habitable than our Earth. Okay, so these are going to be planets with higher gravity, but also more surface area. They probably have thicker atmospheres because of their high gravity. So... You know, these planets could, ha could be unbelievably rich in, in life, and, but they're going to be really different from Earth, you know, with a higher gravity, thicker atmosphere. And because they have the thicker atmospheres, they can be farther from their stars because their atmospheres could be greenhouse. So you could have like uh, an Earth farther from the star. So that was a fascinating article. I would absolutely recommend people to read that article. I mean, it came out several years ago, but I found that article to be really, really interesting. And so I think that gives us a hint that, that you know, who, there's gonna be things that forms of life out there that are totally strange and alien. And that's why it's really important for astronomers and astrobiologists to be very broad in their thinking and not try to think, all life has to be like Earth life or terrestrial life. Okay, thank you. There's a, a few more comments and things down and there's okay. a few links that Mark's put on the chat, but the chat's gonna stay up for a little while. So if you want to have a look at those yourself, everybody, then, then feel free to do it. But we've been talking with Bob now for about two and a half hours. So that's a long time. Yeah. <laughs> to be and talking. I have another talk tonight about cosmology. <laughs> you better go and uh, take yeah. some throat lozenges. Yeah. <laughs> so really, I want to say, wow, you know. Uh, <laughs> I have uh, one right there. <laughs> amazing, amazing. I mean, I, I first heard the, the term astrobiology a couple of years ago uh, when I went to a, a talk in the University of Liverpool by a, a, a man called Lewis Dartnell. And I've heard quite, of him. He's quite a prominent astrobiologist now. He's, he's developed in the last two years. And that was the, the first time I realized that searching for life on other planets wasn't just some cranky wacko thing that, um, that crazy, crazy scientists did. It, it's, actually may, it's actually become mainstream science. Yes. Uh, and, and it's fantastic. And, uh, and you know, your talk was, was um, really a superb talk. I'm thoroughly uh, intriguing and thought provoking and uh, extremely well presented, Bob. So you well, know, thank on you. Behalf, on behalf of the LAS and all the attendees and those that are left, and there's still a large number of us that are left. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say thank you for preparing, you. presenting and giving us so much of your time this evening or this afternoon. And uh, we'll all give you a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> Thank and I'll just say, I hope to maybe visit again in person someday. Um, you know, next time I come to the UK, I'll try to stay longer once this pandemic is behind us. And I really want to thank all of you for tuning in this evening and uh, listening and asking really great questions. And I'll just conclude by what I said during, uh, during my talk. And, you know, I really believe in transatlantic cooperation and, uh, I would love to see more missions in the future, you know, and there's been a lot already and they've been wildly successful, but more NASA ESA missions in the future where we pull our best scientists and engineers, you know, with Britain and France and Germany and other countries, pool everyone's best scientists and engineers okay. 
and do great missions and great space telescopes and answer these great problems of burning interest to humanity. That's what I want to see. Absolutely. Good. Thank you very much, Bob. Now, okay. we, just a couple of things to finish off on. Um, I'm going to tune out now. Thank you all very much. Yeah, I much appreciated, Bob. Thank yeah. you very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Bob. Thank Good night. Good afternoon. Thanks, <laughs> Bob. Thank you. Okay. So, um, oh. we had a lot of... Uh, Good comments uh, and some fantastic questions there. Uh, but I'm going to finish off by saying the date of the next online meeting is the 15th of January, um, starting again at seven o'clock. The speaker's yet to be confirmed, but Mark will uh, send out the um, meeting details, the speaker and the subject uh, a bit nearer the date. And uh, we're waiting for the speaker to confirm. Uh, I'm going to close now and say to everybody, Stay safe during this pandemic, pan, pandemic. And if you're on Zoom, we can turn off the YouTube feed now. Yeah. And, and the recording, Mark. And if you're if you were on Zoom, stay on because we're we're all going to the virtual pub now. So if you've not had enough chatter, <laughs> maybe you have. I don't know. <laughs> stay on, and we're going to move on to the uh, the virtual pub. But if you go in. Thank you very much for, for um, staying the course and I hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you next time. But if you want to go to the pub, stay on. Thank you very right. much. Thanks, Steve. Yep. Cheers. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Thanks Steve. Mark. Excellent. Thank you to everybody Bye. and thank you to those on YouTube as well. Um, it, it's been great that you're taking part and I hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, we'll see you.